You're listening ad-free on Amazon Music. In early 2001, 32-year-old Alex Algieri stood behind the front desk at the Dolphin Fitness Club in Amityville, New York. Alex loved the sounds of a crowded gym, the music pumping through the speakers, weights sliding onto bars, and people cheering each other on as they hit their fitness goals. And a crowded gym also meant that Alex was making money. He and his best friend, Paul Riedel, had opened up Dolphin Fitness two years earlier, and they had turned it into a favorite spot for serious weightlifters and amateur weightlifters alike. There was no question Alex was happy about all the money he was bringing in. He'd always dreamed of being a very successful entrepreneur, but the gym was a lot more to him than just a business. Amityville was a small town on Long Island with a strong sense of community, and Alex wanted his and Paul's gym to reflect that. So from the day they had opened Dolphin Fitness, Alex said he wanted everybody who stepped through the doors to feel like they were part of a family. It didn't matter if people were old or young or what kind of shape they were in. Alex went out of his way to help his customers feel good about themselves and to feel like they belonged, and his customers loved him for it. Alex stepped out from behind the front desk and began making his rounds on the gym floor. Alex was a really strong guy. He was just about six feet, maybe a little bit under, but he looked like a very serious bodybuilder, super jacked. So most people at the gym called him Big Al. Alex had dark hair and a dark goatee, and on this day, he was wearing a long sleeve black shirt and tight jeans, his standard outfit at work. Alex said hello to just about everybody on the gym floor. He knew pretty much everybody by name, and he was excited to see some new members starting off the new year by coming to his gym. Just then, a young man waved at Alex and asked if he wouldn't mind coming over and spotting him on the bench. And Alex said that was fine, and he walked over to the bench press, and Alex told the young man he'd be ready to grab the bar if the young man struggled to lift it. So the young man took a deep breath, he grabbed the bar, brought it down to his chest, and then in one slow but steady movement, he pressed the bar all the way up, and Alex spotted him the whole time shouting words of encouragement, and then finally when the young man had fully extended his arms and fully did a rep, he racked the bar, and he and Alex exchanged high fives and cheered like he just won the Super Bowl or something. Just then, Alex turned and saw a couple of people standing by the front desk. He figured they were potential new members. So Alex scanned the gym and then just shook his head. His partner, Paul, was supposed to be here right now working too, and really it would have been his job to talk to these two new potential members, but Alex hadn't seen Paul on the gym floor in hours. So Alex walked away from the young man he had just spotted and headed over to the front desk and smiled wide and greeted the couple. The rest of that night pretty much went the same way. Alex did everything and ran the gym, and Paul didn't show his face again. And by the end of the night, after Alex had said goodbye to the last customers and locked up, he was feeling frustrated. Why should he do all the work but still give Paul half the profits? Alex angrily marched his way towards the back of the gym, past some aerobics rooms to a small office. Alex knew this is where he would find Paul. Alex opened the door, and there was Paul hunched over in a chair and tapping his fingers on a table. Paul didn't look up when Alex walked in. It was like he was off in his own world. Alex figured Paul must be high on cocaine or some other drug. It was a sight that Alex saw way too often. It made him mad because Paul was his business partner and he wasn't doing his job. But it also broke Alex's heart because Paul really was his best friend and to see him struggle like this was hard. The two men had known each other for years and they'd gotten along from the first time they'd met. They'd both grown up as working class kids who dreamed of having their own business someday and they both loved lifting weights and bodybuilding. So after becoming fast friends, they began to come up with a plan to open their own gym. For years, Alex and Paul had worked different jobs to save up money, and they had also found some outside investors who believed in them. And so eventually, when they had scraped all the cash together, they opened up Dolphin Fitness together. Now, most people who knew them said these two were closer than brothers. Alex had been Paul's best man at his wedding, and he was the godfather to Paul and his wife Leanne's baby boy. Back in the office, Alex shouted Paul's name, and Paul finally realized Alex was in the room with him. When Paul turned around and looked up, Alex could see his eyes were totally bloodshot. Alex really laid into Paul for not helping him run the gym that night, and he said he didn't understand what Paul was even doing with his life. They had achieved their dream of starting their own business. And on top of that, Paul had a beautiful wife and child, so why was he throwing everything away on drugs and partying like he was still a crazy bachelor in his early 20s? Paul was very defensive and shouted a few obscenities at Alex and then basically just told Alex to leave him alone. But Alex said he'd had enough. He told Paul that he was ready to dissolve their business partnership and go start his own gym if he had to. That got Paul's attention. 
He stood up and walked right towards Alex. And Alex was a big guy, but Paul was like a giant. Paul was six foot seven inches tall with a massive chest and huge arms. And Paul just started screaming, and Alex screamed right back. But Alex knew Paul was not someone to mess with when he was high and also angry. So pretty quickly, Alex just said he was done talking for the night, and he walked out of the office. From the hallway, Alex heard Paul scream at the top of his lungs, and then he heard the sound of an office chair go flying into the wall. Alex angrily clenched his jaw, picked up his pace, and grabbed his coat from behind the front desk. Then he headed out the back door of the gym to the parking lot, he climbed into his black Yukon SUV, and took off. And as he drove, he figured Paul was still probably screaming and throwing more furniture. The following day at the gym, Paul apologized to Alex. Alex was used to this. His friend would do drugs, he would lash out, say stupid things, and then feel bad about it the next day and say he was sorry. Alex accepted Paul's apology like he always did, but he just felt tired from having to deal with the same thing over and over again. Alex was all about family, and he loved the people close to him almost unconditionally. But even he was reaching a breaking point with Paul, and he knew he was not the only one who felt this way. Paul's wife, Leanne, was also fed up with Paul's drug use and angry outbursts. In fact, she was so upset with her husband that she'd gone to stay with her mother in Florida until she could figure out if she even wanted to stay married. Alex knew that Leanne leaving had made it really hard on Paul, but he couldn't blame her. After all, the night before, Alex had threatened to leave Paul and go start his own gym. And Alex had meant what he said, but he knew scrapping the Dolphin Fitness Club and trying to start his own gym would not happen overnight. So Alex decided to look at all of his options and start putting together a new business plan. That way, he would feel like he was working towards something. And in the meantime, he hoped and prayed that Paul would get his life together and go back to being the great business partner and best friend that he used to be. A couple of weeks later, on the night of January 17, 2001, Alex was back behind the front desk at the gym. Paul had taken a couple of nights off, which left Alex to run the place on his own. But Alex was used to that, and he really hoped the time away from the gym would do Paul some good. Alex made his usual rounds on the gym floor, talking to customers and encouraging the weightlifters, and then at some point, he heard a woman who was over on the exercise machines shout Big Al over the music. Alex turned and smiled at the woman and began walking over to her. When he reached her, she was very sweaty and out of breath, and she told him right away how excited she was about all the results she was seeing from all her exercising, but she told Alex that she just could not get on board with the music that was playing, and could he please change it? Alex laughed and said of course he would change it, but she told him there was actually this one particular album that really motivated her to work even harder at the gym, and she said Alex had played it during a fitness class that she'd taken from him. And immediately, Alex knew exactly the song she was talking about. He said he had the CD in his car, and he'd just go grab it. Then he turned away from the woman and began walking towards the back door. The cold air hit Alex as soon as he walked out to the parking lot. It was around 35 degrees Fahrenheit, so just above freezing. Alex's coat was still hanging up inside the gym, but it wasn't worth going back for. He'd spent enough winters in Amityville to be used to this kind of cold. So Alex hustled across the parking lot to his black Yukon, when he got to it, he opened up the driver's side door, and the dome light came on. Alex leaned into the SUV and started digging through the CDs that he kept in a case in the passenger seat. Then Alex heard someone shouting behind him in the parking lot, so he pulled his head out of the SUV and he turned to see what was going on, and when he did, he saw someone running directly towards him in the darkness. Back inside the gym, the woman who had asked Alex to change the music, she wiped the sweat from her forehead and looked off towards the back exit. Alex had been gone way longer than she thought he would be, but she figured he must be just having a hard time finding the CD, or maybe he'd stopped in his office to make a phone call before coming back to the gym floor. But then, the woman saw something, and she screamed. Several people stopped their workouts and ran to her to see if she was okay, but she just pointed towards the back of the gym, and then more screams rang out above the music. Alex staggered onto the gym floor. Blood poured down his neck and soaked through his shirt. People ran up to him, and he looked at them, and in a strangled voice, he said, I've been shot. Alex collapsed to the ground. A woman who was a nurse rushed to his side and checked his pulse, and immediately began administering CPR. At the same time, a man ran to the front desk and grabbed the phone and dialed 911. 
A few minutes later, police and paramedics arrived at the gym. And right away, Alex was put on a gurney and rushed outside to a waiting ambulance. Someone had turned off the music by this point, so everybody in the gym just stood there in stunned silence. Most of them were in shock, and they couldn't understand what had even just happened. Everybody loved Alex. Why would someone shoot him? The local police stayed to question everybody at the gym about what they had seen. But their main goal was simply just to get names and contact information for everybody who was there. They knew that a violent crime like this one, that had seemingly just occurred, would quickly be handed off to a larger police force, and so they just wanted to gather up some names to hand off. A couple of hours later, Detective Robert Anderson of the Suffolk County Police Department stepped out of his car in front of the hospital. Anderson looked and dressed more like a professor than a cop. And people who had worked with Anderson during his 34 years in law enforcement said he had a mind like a professor too. He was highly analytical and rarely satisfied with simple answers. Detective Anderson had gotten word that Alex Algieri had been shot outside of the gym that he owned. And Alex had been declared dead soon after being rushed to the hospital. From the minute Anderson was told he would be leading a homicide investigation in Amityville, he knew there would be a ton of pressure on him to solve the case fast because Amityville was not your typical town. Amityville, for decades, had been associated with murder and dark forces. Almost 30 years earlier, in 1974, an Amityville man named Ronald DeFeo Jr. had killed his mother, father, two brothers, and two sisters in their home. The media attention from the mass murder was bad enough for the small, quiet town, but things had only gotten stranger for Amityville after that. The family that wound up moving into the DeFeo house where those murders happened claimed they were terrorized by a demon or some other supernatural entity in the house. This claim eventually drew the attention of very famous paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren, who came out and did their own investigation, and the story of this demon or entity in the home also was eventually turned into a book called The Amityville Horror. And that book has since been spun off into movies and TV shows. I mean, Amityville really became synonymous with evil. And so Detective Anderson knew that Amityville community leaders had worked really hard over the years to kind of correct their image. They didn't want to be known as this violent or cursed town. But this brutal shooting in a gym parking lot threatened to put Amityville right back in the national news for all the wrong reasons. Anderson walked into the hospital and found his way to the private room where Alex's father was waiting for him. Alex's father wiped tears from his face, cleared his throat, and introduced himself to Anderson. But before Alex's father could say much more than his name, he broke down in tears again. Even after 34 years as a cop and dealing with some of the most notorious murders on Long Island, nothing could really prepare Anderson for meeting a parent who had just lost their child. It was the worst kind of loss Anderson could imagine and seeing Alex's father in so much pain really hit him hard. He told Alex's father how sorry he was for his loss. Then Anderson said he hated to put him on the spot at that moment, but he did need to know if there was anyone who might have wanted to hurt his son. Alex's father wiped away his tears and then told Anderson that Alex was the sweetest, kindest man you'd ever meet and that everybody who knew him really loved him. But then he said there definitely was one person who could have done this to his son. Alex's best friend and business partner, Paul Riedel. It turned out Alex had told his father all about Paul's drug use and his partying, and he had also told him that he was thinking about scrapping the business with Paul and going out on his own. Anderson thanked Alex's father for his help and told him how sorry he was again. Then Anderson left the hospital and drove back to the station. He wanted to gather as much information as he could on Paul. It didn't take long for Detective Anderson to discover that Paul had had more than his fair share of run-ins with the law. He had served time in prison for drug charges and armed robbery, and he had previously been linked to an illegal sports gambling ring. But Anderson knew that did not mean the man had killed his best friend. So for the time, Anderson put Paul's police record to the side and dug more into his personal life and his relationship with Alex. The local Amityville police had passed along contact information for everybody they found at the gym when they had first arrived there. And when Anderson and his team reached out to those people, they all said pretty much the same thing. Alex was like family, and everybody loved him. But Paul? He was a mess, and he definitely was capable of shooting Alex. 
Some of Alex's family and closest friends were even more straightforward when they spoke to Anderson. They said they were sure Paul had to be the murderer. So Anderson knew he would just have to go talk to Paul, but he didn't want to drag Paul to the station and chuck him inside of an interrogation room just yet, because he feared as soon as he did that, all of Amityville would decide Paul really was guilty. And so that could potentially destroy an innocent man's life, and it could put even more pressure on police to arrest someone before they were actually ready. So Anderson actually came up with a fairly outside-the-box way to question Paul that was not super formal. Now, it was not going to be ideal by any means, but it was an opportunity Anderson didn't want to miss. His team would talk to Paul at Alex's funeral. Days after Alex's murder, a line of cars stretched out down the street in front of a local funeral home, and they wrapped around the corner. Hundreds of people had come to pay their last respects to Alex. Detective Anderson filed into the funeral home behind a group of mourners. It was common for investigators to attend funerals for homicide victims. It gave them a chance to watch how potential suspects acted. But Anderson was really just there to observe Paul and to see if he could get any information from Paul after the service was over. Anderson watched as Paul made his way to the front of the chapel inside of the funeral home. And it immediately became clear to Anderson that it didn't matter to other people that Paul had not been brought in for questioning yet. Clearly, they had already decided Paul was guilty. People literally shouted at Paul as he walked down the aisle towards his best friend's coffin. They told him to leave and said, how dare he show his face here? Paul didn't engage with any of them. He just stared at the floor and clung to his wife, Leanne, as he walked. Detective Anderson couldn't get over how small this enormous guy seemed to look at this very moment. But Anderson didn't know if he should feel sorry for Paul or if he was just being too cautious and too analytical. Maybe everybody else was right. Maybe this case was clear-cut, and Paul really was the killer. Anderson watched as Alex's friends and family talked about how much Alex had meant to them and how proud they had been of him. Alex's father fought back tears and spoke about all the special times he'd shared with his son. Then he broke down and said Alex would never get to experience those kind of moments with a child of his own, because someone had taken that chance away from him. After the funeral was over, Anderson and some other members of his team separated from the throng of mourners and followed Paul and his wife Leanne outside. The investigators approached, and as they did, Paul suddenly stood up to his full height. Suddenly, the small, kind of sad-looking man Anderson had seen inside had disappeared. Paul now looked angry and huge. Clearly, he did not like the fact that police were bothering him at his best friend's funeral. Anderson assured Paul they were only trying to get some basic information. So Paul just said he loved Alex, he would never hurt him, and on the night of the murder, he said he was with friends in another town. For a minute, Anderson figured his big plan to try to question Paul at this funeral was going to turn into a total bust. But right as he was about to give up on this approach, something suddenly stood out to him. Paul's wife, Leanne, was standing next to her husband doing her part as a very supportive spouse. But Anderson had briefly spoken to Leanne in the days following the murder, so he knew that she and Paul had serious problems in their marriage and that she had even gone to Florida to get away from Paul. And so now Anderson wanted to know if she had had like a big change of heart about her husband, which is why she was now being so supportive, or if she was acting supportive out of fear. If Paul had really killed Alex and Leanne knew about it, was she just afraid she'd be next if she didn't support him? On January 23, 2001, so six days after the murder, Detective Anderson met with Leanne at her grandmother's house in a small town that was not too far from Amityville. Leanne was short and thin with long brown hair, and she sounded like a native New Yorker. She led Anderson into a warm, rustic-looking kitchen, and they sat down at the table. Anderson didn't want Leanne to feel like she was being interrogated, so when he spoke to her, he spoke to her like they were just two friends catching up. Anderson asked Leanne about the funeral and how she felt when she was there, and very quickly she made it clear that she had not gone there out of fear or anything like that. She had been there because she loved her friend Alex, and she wanted to support her husband Paul. She said that despite their marital issues, they really had been working hard on their marriage. But Anderson wasn't convinced, and so he pressed Leanne a bit, and he asked what had happened that made her leave New York and go to Florida in the first place. Leanne said she'd left because Paul was partying and doing drugs, and she felt like that was a terrible environment for her kid. 
But Leanne was clear that she did not believe Paul would ever kill his friend Alex. Sure, the two men fought sometimes, but they were like brothers, and brothers fight. She knew Paul loved Alex. Anderson said he understood, and then he asked her if there was anything else she could think of that might help with the investigation. Leanne shifted in her chair, and then looked around the room like she was trying to make sure nobody else was listening. Then she leaned closer to Anderson, and in a quiet voice, she told him there was something going on that he needed to know about. Paul had gotten into trouble with the mob, and he had actually received a rat card in the mail. Anderson hid his surprise pretty well, but this was news to him. He knew Paul had a police record, and that he'd been linked to some low-level criminals who might have loose ties to the mob. But receiving a rat card meant that members of the mob believed Paul had sold them out to the police, an unforgivable offense in the world of organized crime. Then Leanne told Anderson that things had actually gotten even worse after that. At a big party a year earlier, Paul had gotten into this big public argument with a man who wound up being a captain in the Gambino organized crime family. At the time, the Gambinos were one of the most powerful mafia organizations in New York City. Leanne said Paul never told her what the argument was about, but she was pretty sure he owed a lot of money to some very powerful people. Detective Anderson listened quietly, and he still didn't show anything on his face, but he knew this case might have just taken a major turn. It was one thing for Paul to be connected to some small-time criminals in Amityville, New York, but it was a whole different thing for Paul to be in debt to high-ranking members of a New York City mafia family. Anderson talked to Leanne a little while longer and then thanked her for her time. He headed out to his car and drove back to Amityville. In the course of only a few hours, Anderson had been forced to take a completely different view on this case. He still considered Paul a suspect, but now Anderson had a totally new theory as to what could have happened. He thought maybe the mafia had put out a hit on Alex, so Paul's best friend, as a way to warn Paul. Pay us the money you owe us, or you'll be next. In February of 2001, so about a month after Alex's murder, Detective Anderson got word that Paul and Leanne had reconciled and repaired their marriage. But there was more to the story than that. Paul had moved with Leanne and their kid down to Florida, and members of Alex's family and a lot of other people in Amityville were up in arms about it. Many people in the community had never stopped believing that Paul killed Alex, and now they thought Paul had left the state to run away from the crime he had committed. The pressure on Anderson to arrest Paul continued to grow, and some people questioned whether Anderson was even doing his job. But Anderson understood their frustration. He also wanted to bring Alex's killer to justice. But he wasn't just going to cave in and arrest Paul because he actually didn't have any concrete evidence against Paul. Anderson's team had confirmed Paul's alibi for the night of the murder, and they'd combed over the crime scene at the gym multiple times, and nothing they found directly linked Paul to Alex's murder. On top of that, Anderson was following up on leads that connected Paul to the mafia. He was supposedly in debt to dangerous men, he had had that public fight with a member of the Gambino family, and Alex's murder did seem to look like it could have been a mob-style hit. So Anderson remained focused and calm, and he kept pursuing all of the possible leads in the case. He also told his team not to be swayed by public opinion. Just because others had already made up their minds about what had happened did not mean they needed to do that too. But over the next month, Anderson hit one dead end after another. He couldn't discover any definitive links between Paul and the Gambino family or any other high-ranking members in the mafia. Then in April, so three months after Alex's murder, Anderson found out that Leanne was pregnant. And this news sparked another round of anger from the Amityville community and threatened to make Anderson's job even harder than it already was. People were outraged that Paul was allowed to carry on with his life and watch his family grow after he had robbed his best friend Alex of a chance to start his own family. Anderson continued to sympathize with the people who were frustrated with him. He knew they just wanted answers. So Anderson kept working every angle of the case he could think of, but he felt like he was running out of time. He needed a break in the case to help appease his loudest critics and to at least give Alex's family some hope that justice would be served. On November 11, 2001, so almost 10 months after Alex's murder, a detective from the New York City Police Department sat across a table from a guy in custody and listened to him rambling about how he could help the police. The NYPD detective almost found the whole thing kind of amusing. It was pretty common for people in custody to try to cut a deal by giving up information on crimes that were even worse than the ones they'd committed. A lot of times, though, the so-called leads these people provided went absolutely nowhere. 
but occasionally some leads would pan out. So the detective sat there with a slight smile on his face and just listened. But then the guy in custody said something that really caught the detective's attention. And so his smile disappeared and he leaned forward and told the guy to slow down and repeat what he just said. The guy nodded and leaned in closer, almost like he and the detective were on the same team. Then he repeated what he had just said. He said he knew who had killed that gym owner in Amityville and he knew why they killed him. Now remember, Amityville is a small town about two hours away from Manhattan. And so criminals trying to cut a deal with the NYPD did not usually reference small town crimes like this one. So the detective sensed this could actually be legitimate. So he got all the details he could from this guy in custody about Alex Aguirre's murder. Then the detective walked out of the room, went to his desk, and made a phone call. A second later, an officer with the Suffolk County Police told Detective Anderson there was a call for him from an NYPD detective. The officer said that this detective was calling with information about the Alex Aguirre case, and it could potentially break the case wide open. Anderson walked to his desk, and as he did, he felt a rush of adrenaline. This was the first time in months that he actually might have a possible new lead. On the phone, the NYPD detective told Anderson about the conversation he'd just had with the guy in custody. Both detectives were well aware that desperate people under arrest were not usually the most reliable sources because they basically will do anything to get out of custody, but the NYPD detective thought the information he'd gotten was actually worth passing on. Anderson listened to the detective and scribbled down the name of a man that he needed to track down. Anderson thanked the NYPD detective for his help, and then he quickly rounded up his team and told them they might finally have a major break in the Alex Aguirre case. The information Anderson got from the NYPD detective led him right to a man who was supposedly involved in Alex's murder. The man was clearly struggling with drug addiction, he seemed jittery and all over the place when he spoke, and he spun a wild story about how and why Alex had been murdered. At first, Anderson wasn't sure he could believe anything this man told him, but Anderson and his team dug deeper into the man's story, and several of the details checked out. And after that meeting, it would still take Detective Anderson several months to put everything together, but he finally had evidence connecting someone directly to Alex's murder. Based on interviews conducted throughout the investigation and evidence found at the scene, here is a reconstruction of what police believe happened on the night of January 17th, 2001, when somebody murdered Alex outside of his gym. At about 7 p.m., a white minivan drove past the Dolphin Fitness Club. Inside the van were two people. There was the driver and also the killer. And the killer was scanning the area for the perfect spot to stake the place out. Both people inside the van wore zip-up hooded sweatshirts, and the killer rested a 38 caliber pistol on his knee. The killer pointed to an empty parking space on the street that had a clear view of the employee parking lot. So the driver drove around towards the back of the gym, pulled the van into that parking space, and then turned off the engine. Then the driver and the killer kept their eyes fixed on the employee parking lot and made small talk to pass the time. The killer figured it could be hours before they could make their move, but they were willing to wait as long as it took, because this area, this employee parking lot, offered the best place to shoot someone without being seen. The lot was dark, and only a few people ever parked there. The killer checked their gun to make sure it was loaded, then they, along with the driver, just kept on talking and watching the parking lot. But then, just 20 minutes later, the killer suddenly sat up in the passenger seat and leaned in closer to the window. The wait had not been long at all. Their target was already in the parking lot, walking towards his black Yukon SUV. The killer told the driver to start the van and to be ready to speed out of there. The killer clutched the pistol tight in one hand, then opened the door with the other and walked into the parking lot. The killer saw Alex open up his car door and lean inside, and as he did, the dome light came on. Not wanting to be too close to the light, the killer shouted something at Alex just to get his attention and to kind of pull him away from his vehicle and the light. And it worked because Alex turned to see who was yelling at him, and he took a few steps away from his car towards the killer. And at that point, the killer just rushed out of the darkness and got within a couple of feet of Alex, who had no idea what was going on, and the killer raised his gun and fired before Alex could do anything. The first bullet hit Alex square in the chest. Then the killer squeezed off three more shots, one right after the other. 
Bullets struck Alex across his upper body, perforating his heart and both of his lungs. Then the killer fired off one more shot, which hit Alex in the neck. Alex fell to the ground, covered in blood. At this point, the killer turned and ran back to the white van. The killer never saw Alex pulling himself up and staggering back towards the gym. As soon as the killer was back inside the van, they slammed the door shut and yelled for the driver to go. So the driver whipped out of the parking space and sped down the street. A few minutes later, the driver heard ambulance and police sirens on the other side of the road, so they eased off the gas. They didn't want to draw attention to the van. When they were a few miles away from the gym, the killer spotted a creek just off the side of the road. So they rolled down their window and hurled the gun into the water. Then they told the driver to floor it, and the van sped down the road again. Not long after that, the driver pulled onto the highway, and the van headed south, far away from Amityville, New York. The following night, the killer and the driver sat in the killer's living room, reading an online story about the murder. The shooting outside the gym had made the national news, but the killer and driver read the story more than once because they could not believe what they were seeing. Then the front door opened, and before the killer could even say anything, a woman barged in and shouted at him at the top of her lungs, You stupid bastard, you killed the wrong guy! It would turn out Leanne Riedel, Paul's wife, had set up the hit outside of the gym. But Alex was never the intended target. Leanne had wanted her husband, Paul, dead. And the killer, a man named Rocco Salerno, had been more than happy to oblige because it turned out that Leanne and Rocco had been having an affair since Leanne had left New York and went to stay with her mother in Florida. Leanne and Rocco had fallen in love and wanted to start their lives together, but Paul was in the way. To make things worse, Paul had already filed with a court in New York to begin divorce proceedings. And if Paul and Leanne got divorced, well, New York law would require Leanne to come back to the state and live within 50 miles of Paul so he could see his son. But Leanne didn't want to leave Florida and Rocco, so she and Rocco hatched a plan to murder Paul. Rocco paid a guy he knew $3,000 to drive him to New York, scope out the gym with him, and serve as his getaway driver after the shooting took place. So, on the night of the murder, Rocco and this driver are sitting there, and they see this huge guy walk into the parking lot, and he goes to his black Yukon, and Rocco thought this was his target because Paul was also a big guy who happened to own the same make and model of Black Yukon that his best friend Alex owned. So Rocco rushed out of the van and gunned down Alex in cold blood, not realizing he had shot the wrong person. When Leanne discovered what had happened, she came up with a way to try to fix things. She reconciled with Paul so he wouldn't divorce her and make her move back to New York. Then she convinced Paul to move to Florida because so many people in Amityville, including his friends, were treating him like a murderer. And then once they were back in Florida, Leanne just continued her affair with Rocco. And her plan was to divorce Paul after both of them had become Florida residents, because that way she would not be forced to leave the state. And all of this came to light after the guy in custody with the NYPD told police he had information about Alex's murder. It turned out the guy in custody actually happened to know the driver of the white minivan, and so this guy in custody had actually heard all the details of everything that had happened during the murder. So Detective Anderson tracked the driver down, and he discovered that the driver was struggling with a drug problem, and the driver said that's why he had accepted the $3,000 to drive Rocco to and from the gym in Amityville, and the driver quickly cut a plea deal, and he would give authorities everything they needed to bring Rocco in. But even with Rocco in custody, Leanne denied having anything to do with the murder. She said she had always loved Paul, and that they had even had a second child together. Leanne also tried to act like she barely knew Rocco. But soon it became clear that the child that Leanne had recently given birth to was not her husband Paul's, it was Rocco's child. And at that point, all of Leanne's denials about her role in this murder quickly fell apart. The actual killer, Rocco Salerno, was convicted of conspiracy and first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. As for Leanne, she was convicted of conspiracy and first-degree murder as well and was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. She continued to maintain her innocence and appealed her conviction, but the appeal was denied. Alex's best friend Paul might have had some demons, but he had nothing to do with his friend's murder. Paul was granted custody of his and Leanne's child, and with his child, he returned to Amityville. 
He ended up renaming the gym Big Al's Family Fitness in honor of his fallen friend. And Paul has said that he strives to live his life and run his business with the type of integrity and kindness that would make Alex proud. Nicknamed the Great Gray Green Greasy, the Limpopo River is one of Africa's largest rivers. It serves as a border between Zimbabwe and South Africa, and it also happens to be one of the most dangerous places on Earth. A town in South Africa called Falaborwa sits on Limpopo's shores, and all of its residents know they're never supposed to step foot inside of the dangerous waterway, but not all of their residents take that guidance seriously. On January 1st, 2010, Falaborwa resident Mariska Beitendog, along with her boyfriend and six of their other friends, had been out all night partying celebrating the new year. They had had a considerable amount of alcohol over the course of the night, so as the sun was coming up, in their inebriated state, they decided they wanted to take an early morning dip in the Limpopo River. So they head over to the river, and while initially they all seemed really eager to get in the waterway, it was only Mariska that was brave enough to do it. So the rest stayed on shore, and Mariska jumped in the river and jumped right out again. And she survived, and everyone was very impressed with her. And so she's confident, and so she does it again, this time going a little bit farther out into the river before coming back on shore. Now she's really confident, she's done it twice. And so she said, hey, who wants to come with me for a third time in? And the group said, no, we're still good, and you really shouldn't push your luck. This is not safe. And she said, I don't care, I'm going in for a third time. So Mariska gets in the water and by herself, she swims out on her back about 15 meters away from shore. She turns and waves at the group and smiles before she is violently pulled under the water. There wasn't even time for her to scream. Her boyfriend immediately jumped into the water to try to pull her out, but he knew where she was and there was no way he was getting her back. The other nickname for the Limpopo River is Crocodile River, and Mariska unfortunately had fell victim to one of its apex predators. But it's not just drunk partygoers that fall victim to these crocodiles. Unfortunately for the residents of Zimbabwe, because of the extreme hardships they have to face, many of them have been forced to flee the country and cross over the Limpopo River to try to gain entry into South Africa, and many of them will die trying. On April 11th, 2014, Zimbabwean and South African police discovered this crocodile-infested cave right near where Zimbabwean residents will try to cross over the Limpopo River, and inside of this cave were the remains of 15 people that presumably tried to cross over and were caught by crocodiles. The discovery of this cave and the 15 people who lost their lives inside of it, while tragic and certainly gruesome, it only represents a fraction of the total number of people who have died trying to cross this river. The next story, which is our number two story on today's list, is called No Way Out. In 1986, 35 million Americans went to see the brand new movie Crocodile Dundee, which was a comedy that starred this very capable and rugged Australian crocodile hunter who goes to New York City. One of the 35 million Americans who saw this film was a 24-year-old model from Virginia named Ginger Meadows. And after seeing this film, Ginger felt inspired to actually go to Australia to see it for herself because it looked so amazing in this movie. So a couple of months later, in March of 1987, Ginger, by herself, hops on a plane and flies to Perth, which is a major city in Western Australia. And her plan was she would land in Australia and then work odd jobs to make a little bit of cash and then use that cash to fund her travels all over the country. And then at some point after she was tired of doing that, she would head back to the United States. So she lands in Perth and immediately she sees her first opportunity to make some money. There had been this huge sailing competition in the city leading up to the weekend she arrived there, and so she saw all these luxury yachts anchored at all these docks along the coastline, and Ginger's thinking to herself, you know, these huge ships, they have crews that work on them basically full time, maybe one of these boats could use an extra set of hands. And so Ginger, who was very friendly and outgoing, she went right down to one of these docks and she stopped in front of the very first yacht she saw, which was this huge luxury 100 foot yacht. And she introduced herself to the captain of this boat. And she said, hey, you know, can I hitch a ride with you guys to the next place you're going? And in exchange, I'll work for you. 
And as it happened, the captain was actually looking for another crew member to assist their chef. And so he said, okay, well, can you cook? And Ginger said, yeah, I'm a great cook. And he said, okay, well, you're hired. You can be the chef's assistant. And so Ginger, she climbs on board and she meets the rest of the five other crew members, including the chef who she'd be working with. And the chef's name was Jane and those two would become very close. And then shortly after Ginger had come aboard, the captain cast off their lines and they headed out to sea. Their next stop was going to be New Guinea, which was roughly 14 days of travel away. After about a week at sea, the captain realized they were dangerously low on fresh water, and so he decided to take a detour and turn east and head inland along this river system that would bring them to this large freshwater pool, which he also knew had this huge waterfall that dumped down into it, and so he figured they could go right underneath this waterfall and fill up their jugs with all this fresh water and then head back out and they'd be good. So on the morning of March 29th, the captain anchored the yacht out at sea near the mouth of this river system, and then he lowered the yacht's dinghy, which was a smaller, more agile boat. And once that was in the water, he, Ginger, Jane, and the rest of the crew, they hop in this dinghy along with all these large, empty water jugs, and they begin making their way towards this river. And so they're traveling up this river for a little while, and then finally they get to this huge freshwater pool, and right in front of them is this amazing waterfall, and everybody is just totally awestruck by this waterfall. It's like a gem in the middle of nowhere because they're in very rugged Australia at this point. And so the captain, he brings the dinghy right near the base of the waterfall and one by one, they hold up their water jugs and they fill them with fresh water. And then they're about to turn and go back out to sea and get back on their yacht. When the captain thinks to himself, you know what, we've been at sea for seven days straight. It's been very monotonous. Maybe it would be a good thing to stick around here for a little bit longer and maybe even hike up to the top of this waterfall and enjoy the view and kind of enjoy the scenery before we head back out to sea. And so he says to his crew, hey, do you guys want to go to the top of this waterfall? And everyone agrees it's a great idea, with the exception of Jane. She did not feel like hiking to the top of this waterfall. She said she would stay down in the dinghy and wait for them. Now, this pool is basically surrounded on all sides by just pure cliff face. There really is no place to land this dinghy. There's no flat surfaces. You basically have cliffs that go directly into water, and then also you have the river that feeds back out to the ocean. So the captain brings the dinghy right up against the cliff face right next to this waterfall, and he and Ginger and the other crew members not named Jane climb out of the dinghy onto this cliff face, and they begin climbing, literally climbing up this wall towards the top of the waterfall. Now, everyone was able to do it except for Ginger. She kept slipping on the rocks. It was very steep. It seemed kind of dangerous. And so at some point, she abandons the idea and goes back down to the dinghy with Jane and the captain and the rest of the crew, they continue up towards the top. And so as Ginger and Jane are sitting in the dinghy watching the other crew members making their way up, they start feeling a little bit left out and they're like, you know what? Let's try to find an alternate way up to the top of this waterfall. And so they begin scanning out across this pool at the other cliffs kind of surrounding it. And it looked like on the very other side of the pool, there was a less severe cliff face that maybe they would have an easier time climbing up. And so the two women, they jump into the murky brown water and begin swimming directly across this pool towards this other cliff. And when they make it about a third of the way, Jane suddenly stops and Ginger notices and turns around and looks at Jane and she's like, what's going on? And Jane would tell her, you know, something just feels off. This doesn't feel right. Let's go back to the dinghy. Let's just forget about this. But Ginger is like, come on, we're so close. Let's just keep going. It'll be awesome once we get to the top of this waterfall. And so Jane, she's totally hesitant, but she says, okay, fine. And they both continue to swim. And then all of a sudden, they hear their captain, who is now on top of the waterfall, screaming down to them to get out of the water right now. And they notice he is pointing down at the pool in a direction slightly away from where they were. And so they're looking up at him and they're following his finger down to the part of the pool he's pointing at. And they see there is this tidal wave of water coming towards them. It is a 12 foot long saltwater crocodile that has noticed them and it is charging straight at them. Now, Jane and Ginger knew they were too far away from the dinghy to be able to swim to it before this crocodile was going to reach them. And so their next best choice was just to turn and swim towards the nearest cliff face. Because again, there is no place to get out of the water. There's only cliffs. 
And so they swim towards this cliff face, which is right on the edge of the bottom of the waterfall. And so water is landing on them and they reach the cliff face and they're trying to climb up and pull themselves out of the water, but there's nowhere to grab onto. It's all totally slick. There's no good handholds. And so all they have is this little ledge that is in the water that they're standing on, but they're still halfway into the water. And so after they struggle for a minute trying to pull themselves out of the water and they realize they can't do it, they both just turn around and they lock arms and they look out through the water that's falling down in front of them into the pool and they see this crocodile has followed them and it has now stopped right on the other side of the water that's falling down and it's just staring at them with its mouth wide open. And the two women are looking at it, they don't know what to do, and the captain and the other crew members, they see what's going on, and they're trying to climb down as fast as they possibly can to try to rescue them, but it's going to take several minutes at least before they get down to the dinghy. And so Jane and Ginger, they're totally aware of this, and they're just staring at this crocodile, screaming at it, trying to get it to go away. And at some point, the crocodile does just close its mouth and sink below the surface. But now they don't know where it is, and this causes Ginger to completely panic, and she lets Let's go of Jane's arm and she dives into the water off to the right and attempts to swim away from the crocodile back over to the boat. But Ginger only made it two strokes before the crocodile suddenly re-emerged underneath her and grabbed her by the waist and pulled her under the water. Jane is just standing there watching all of this happen in front of her. She has no idea what to do. The crew is still not down in the dinghy, so she's totally stranded. And she's just staring at the area where Ginger has been pulled below the surface. And just seconds after she's been pulled under, the crocodile re-emerges with its head pointed towards Jane. And in its jaws is Ginger. And Ginger's got her arms up over her head. She's wide-eyed and she's looking right at Jane. And Jane makes eye contact with her, but there's nothing she can do. And she just walks watched as Ginger again was pulled back under, and this time she did not come up again. Ultimately, Jane would be rescued from the ledge. The crew would get down to the dinghy, they'd swing over, they would pick her up, and then about two days later, they would find what was left of Ginger's remains. It would turn out the captain was well aware of the threat the crocodiles posed in this river, and he had told his crew, Ginger and Jane included, about this threat, and that at no point should anyone get in this water. But, of course, his warning went unheeded. The next and final story, so our top story of today's list, is called Blackwater. At 11.40 a.m. on December 21st, 2003, three young men who were longtime childhood friends hopped in a truck and began traveling south. They were 22-year-old Brett Mann and 19-year-olds Sean Blowers and Ashley McGuff. They lived in a coastal city called Darwin, which is actually the capital of the Northern Territory in Australia. The Northern Territory, also known as the Top End, is located in the central north of the continent. It is six times larger than the UK, but has 280 times less people living in it. Specifically, the UK is home to roughly 70 million people, whereas the top end is home to only 250,000 people, and half of them live in Darwin. There are many reasons why the top end is so underpopulated, ranging from politics to poor infrastructure, but the most obvious reason that so few people choose to live in this part of Australia is because it is wildly rugged and dangerous. It is scorchingly hot year-round, and the weather in general is just unbelievably unpredictable and violent. And, as the old saying goes, all the animals there are trying to kill you and each other. But Brett, Sean, and Ashley had grown up in Darwin, and so they were accustomed to the hazards of living in the top end, and so they weren't really concerned about them. What they were concerned with was finding things to do and not getting bored in the city. That particular day, in order to ward off boredom, the trio had decided they would head out to a salt flat that was located about 50 miles to the southwest of Darwin. It was this wide open plain that they could just race around on their quad bikes on. And so they loaded these quad bikes into their trailer, attached it to their truck, they hopped in their truck, and at 11.40 a.m., they started heading south out of Darwin. 
The first road they were on was this fairly desolate dirt road that wound around through the wilderness and it passed by the iconic eucalyptus trees that are very well known in Australia. It passed by palm trees and giant termite mounds. And after driving on this dirt road for about 30 minutes, the trio passed by the Tumbling Waters Holiday Park, which is a vacation resort for adventurous families. And then beyond this park, there really was no more civilization. They were headed right into the outback of Australia. And so this was kind of like the last mark of civilization. And so the trio, they drive for another 30 minutes past the park. And at some point, all of the trees on either side of the road start getting more and more dense until they begin kind of encroaching over the road as if it looks like you're driving directly through the heart of a jungle. And they would have recognized this change in scenery as meaning they were nearing the Finnis River, which was off to the right beyond all of the trees. So they couldn't see it, but they knew they were close. And the Finnis River was not a huge waterway. It was a 30 mile stretch that ran east to west through the top end. And what it was known for was being very brackish and dark. You could not see into this water more than maybe an inch or two. So it almost appeared black. And so the trio continued driving along through this kind of jungle atmosphere until the left side of the road began to thin out again, and then it eventually revealed the salt flats up to their left. And so at that point, the trio pulled off on the right side of the road where the vegetation was still very thick. And then the trio hopped out of the truck, they went around to their trailer, they dropped the gate, and one by one they pulled their quad bikes off, and then each of them hopped on and drove out onto the flats. That day, the flats were actually very muddy because it had recently rained really, really heavy in that area. And so the trio spent just as much time racing each other on the flats as they did trying to drive close to each other and spray mud on each other. And so for hours, they were out there having a great time. And then at 4.30 p.m., they decided it was time to call it a day. And so they drove back over to the truck. They drove their quad bikes up onto the trailer. They locked it. And then they were about to get into the truck to head back home when one of them suggested, hey, let's head down to the water and rinse our clothes off and get all this mud off of us. Now, you need to understand, in the top end, the place you want to spend the least amount of time in is the water. People in the top end assume that in any natural water body that is not clearly designated as a swimming area has at least one animal lurking in it that will kill you. This is a literal precaution people in the top end take. And so this section of the Finnis River that these three friends were thinking about going and jumping into and washing off inside of, this was not a clearly designated swimming area, and so it should be avoided. But you need to remember, these three guys, they grew up in the top end. They were used to living in this kind of wild area, and they'd also come to the salt flats so many times over the years, and they had jumped into the Finnis River before to wash off and go swimming, and nothing had ever happened. And so really, the idea that the Finnis River could be dangerous to them, it didn't really cross their mind. They felt like, you know what, we've been there, done that, nothing's going to happen to us. And so they left the truck and walked away from the salt flats into this mangrove forest that's only a couple of feet off the road and began walking towards this river. Normally, the trip from the road through the forest to the river bank, basically where the forest ended and you reached the river, it would take about 10 minutes. But after walking in this mangrove for maybe a minute, they were already standing in river water. It was only a couple of inches of this water, but it signaled to the guys that clearly the river is very swollen from all of the recent rains, enough so that it overflowed beyond its natural boundaries and it's flooded the mangrove forest. But the three guys, they look at each other and think, meh, what's the big deal? I'm sure we'll be fine. And so the guys continued moving on, but as the mangroves began to thin out, they began to slow down dramatically. But because the riverbanks on the edges of the Finnis River were very, very steep. If you were standing on dry land, if there was no flooding, and you were right on the edge of the Finnis River, if you took even one or two steps into the river, you would slip down under the water and the water would be over your head. Now, as these guys are walking, because the ground is flooded with this black, brackish water, they couldn't see the ground, and so they couldn't tell where the drop-off into the river was. 
And so they began to slow down. And then when all the trees were practically gone, they knew they were close. And then one of them actually slipped and kind of tumbled down the edge for a second. But he turned and he grabbed one of the roots of the mangrove tree and pulled himself back up. And then the other two, after seeing this, they walked over and stood next to him. And the trio just stood there looking out at this pitch black looking river that was very clearly moving faster than normal because of all this excess rain. But they kind of looked at each other and thought, you know what, it's not that big of a deal. You know, we'll hold on to the roots of these mangroves and lower ourselves over the embankment. We'll wash ourselves off, pull ourselves back up. No big deal. And so they each turned around and grabbed a root of one of the many mangrove trees that marked the edge of this forest. And while holding on, they would lower their lower half down past the embankment until they were submerged. They rubbed all the mud off of themselves, being very careful not to let go of the mangrove at any point. And then as they were about to finish up and pull themselves back up and get back to their truck, when Brett loses his balance and somehow lets go of the mangrove root and slips down the steep embankment and suddenly the current takes him away from his friends and out to the middle of this river and before long he's getting pulled downstream. And so he yells out to Ashley and Sean who had their backs turned to him. They turn around, they see their friend and they instinctively leap into the river to try to go get him and help swim him back to the side. Now, all three of them were very competent swimmers, and so this was not a high panic situation. This was more like a inconvenience and maybe a little bit funny, and so that's why they left in no problem. They figured, you know, worst case scenario is we'll drift somewhere down there and we'll get out and we'll walk our way back to our car. But as soon as Sean and Ashley were free floating in this river, they felt how strong this current was, and it was way stronger than they were anticipating. And so they actually started to get a little bit worried, and they looked up ahead of them, and Brett, who had been in the water for, you know, 10 or 15 seconds before they leapt in, he had already moved way farther downstream than them. And so they decided, you know what, we have to get out, but we need to get to Brett first. We all need to get out at the same place. And so they decide they're going to swim downstream, meet up with Brett, and then get the heck out of that river as fast as they possibly can. And so they yell out to Brett to, hey, we're coming to get you. And they start swimming as fast as they possibly can. And with the help of the current, they manage to get all the way up to Brett relatively quickly, maybe a couple of minutes. And when they reach him, Sean and Ashley go in front of Brett. And then the three of them, they stop actively swimming and they allow the current to just kind of carry them downstream. And as they're drifting, they begin scouting the left side of the river for a solid clump of mangrove trees they can swim into. Because unless there's something to grab onto on the edge of this river, they can't pull themselves out. And so at this point, the trio is definitely uncomfortable being in the water because of how strong that current is. But they're confident they're going to find a viable landing spot and they're going to get out of here and it will be a great story. And so Sean is in the front, Ashley is right behind him, and then Brett is behind Ashley. And they're all about an arm's length away from each other. And they're drifting down this river for a couple of minutes. They're looking on the left side for a viable landing spot. And then all of a sudden, Ashley just yells out, Hey, I see something in the water. We need to get out. Find the nearest tree. Get out, get out, get out. And so Sean, he starts panicking. He doesn't even turn around to see what's going on behind him. Adrenaline kicks in and he swims as fast as he possibly can to a tree that's popped out of the river. It's literally growing in the middle of the river. And so he swims up to this tree. He manages to climb up to the first fork of the tree, which is maybe six or eight feet above the water. And as soon as he's up there, he turns around and looks down and he sees Ashley. He reaches down and he hoists Ashley up to the first fork with him. And then the pair turn around again to grab Brett, but Brett's not there. And so they look around, they're thinking, okay, did Brett not make it to the tree? Did the current pull him around? Is he at some other tree? You know, they're yelling out for him. They're looking for him, but there's no Brett. And so they're talking to each other, Ashley and Sean. They're saying, hey, did you, did he call out? Did you hear something? Did he give some indication about where he was going? And they're saying, no, I, I don't know where he is. And so they start climbing up the tree a little bit and trying to look down and up the river to see if maybe they can see him. And then all of a sudden, Sean notices something yellow flash beneath them in the water. And so he looks straight down and he sees this yellow thing down there. And so he nudges Ashley and he says, look, and so Ashley looks down, and as they're looking, they're about 10 feet off the water at this point, they see this yellow thing start rising up to the surface. Now the water is so dark, they really can't tell what anything is unless it is at the surface. And so they're watching this yellow thing, and suddenly it comes out of the water, and they see it's Brett. He's got his yellow jacket on, that's what they saw. And Brett is in the mouth of a 13 foot long saltwater crocodile. He is face down and his left side is being held in this animal's mouth and he's not moving. 
And so Sean and Ashley are so scared, they're just frozen. They're just staring at this monster that's in the water that's holding their friend underwater, and they can't do anything about it. And for two minutes, they just stand there looking at this animal, wondering what's going to happen. And for those entire two minutes, the crocodile stared right back up at Ashley and Sean as if it was showing them what it was going to do to them once they got in the water. That I've done this to your friend, I'm getting you to as well. And so they're staring at this animal when suddenly it just kind of goes underneath the water back down into the black abyss and it, along with Brett, just disappear. Ashley and Sean are so terrified that they can't even grieve for their friend. They can't feel sad for him. It's like they just go into survival mode. And without saying anything to each other, they just start climbing up this tree as fast and as far as they possibly can. And they only manage to get up maybe a couple more feet to two more branches. One's at about 10 or 12 feet off the water and the other is at about 15 feet off the water. And so Sean makes it onto the lower branch and then Ashley makes it onto the slightly higher branch. And then once they're situated on their branch and one arm is firmly wrapped around the trunk of the tree, they're able to kind of breathe for a second and take stock of their situation. And even though, of course, the elephant in the room here is that their friend was just eaten by a crocodile, but it's like they can't process that yet. Instead, they start talking about, okay, well, our families, they're going to recognize our absence and they're going to tell the police and the police are going to launch a search and they're going to come find us. Both of them were confident or they acted confident that that was going to happen, but they also knew that there was no timeline for this. It could be hours or days until this actually happened. And so as these two teens are sitting on their branches, the reality of their situation really started to come crashing down on them. Because yeah, they're safe in this tree, but how long can they possibly stay in this tree for? I mean, eventually they're gonna need to fall asleep. And if they fall asleep, are they gonna fall out of the tree and land in the water with this crocodile? I mean, they just didn't know how this was gonna turn out. And so as the two began comforting each other, you know, reassuring each other that, oh no, it's going to be just fine. Someone's going to find us tonight or tomorrow will be just fine. As they're doing that, Ashley suddenly stops talking to Sean and just looks straight down. And so Sean realizes what Ashley's doing and he matches his gaze and he looks straight down and at the base of their tree in that black water is the 13 foot long saltwater crocodile. It's back and it no longer has Brett in its mouth. They have no idea where Brett is. He's just gone. Saltwater crocodiles are considered the most aggressive and dangerous crocodiles in the world. And they are one of only two crocodile species that will actively hunt humans when given a chance. And so these two teens are helpless in this tree. All they have is some separation from the black water and this animal down below. And so they just find themselves staring straight down at this crocodile. And in turn, this crocodile just stares right back up at them. It's very clearly waiting for them. It wants them to come out of the tree so it can eat them. And so the crocodile just continuously repositions itself all around the tree. It's just keeping the top of its head out of the water so its eyes can look up at them. And so the teens are just praying that at some point it will grow tired of them and will leave. And after several hours, right as the sun is about to set, this crocodile does seem to give up on them and it drifts under the water and disappears. After a couple of minutes, Sean, who was on the slightly lower branch, decides he doesn't want to be any closer to the water than he needs to be, and he's going to climb up to Ashley's branch. And so he very carefully stands up on his branch. He makes sure he's got solid footing. And then he reaches up and he grabs a branch with his right hand. And he kind of tests it and he feels like it's pretty sturdy. And then he puts all his weight on it and tries to reach for another branch when this one breaks. And as soon as that branch broke, Sean tumbled 10 feet into the water. So he hits the water, he goes all the way under, he sinks a few feet under, and immediately he's turned around and he's trying to swim as fast as he can to the surface and he's just expecting at any moment this crocodile is going to bite him. He gets to the surface and he looks around, it's a little bit dark, but he can immediately see his tree and he realizes the current has pulled him away from his tree. And so in a panic, he starts swimming and kicking his legs as hard as he possibly can to get back to this tree. And he knows the whole time he's kicking his legs, he's just attracting the attention of this crocodile, but he's got nothing else he can do. He's got no other tree he can reasonably get to that will provide safety from this animal. 
And so with every ounce of energy he's got, he kicks and swims, and finally he manages to grab a root of this tree that his friend is still inside of, and he begins pulling himself with his lower half still submerged in the water. And so as he's dragging himself towards the trunk of this tree, he's just waiting for this crocodile to bite down on his legs. And finally he gets to the trunk of the tree and he's able to pull his body out of the water and he clambers up to that original branch he was on. And then he and Ashley work to get him up to Ashley's branch. And as soon as he sits down next to Ashley and he's secure, they both look down and just a little ways away from the tree, basically in the area where Sean had just landed in the water, they see with the little light that is left, this crocodile swimming right back over to the tree and it camps out right underneath. Sean had gotten out just in time. When the sun finally did set about 10 or 15 minutes later, it became pitch black. There's no ambient light in this part of the world. There aren't any buildings or cities close enough to this area. And so it is truly pitch black. And so they could no longer see the crocodile down below. But they knew it was there because periodically they would hear it repositioning itself right underneath them. Also, because it was so dark, the two teens could not actually see each other. And so they began holding on to each other, and then any time either of them moved, they would announce their movement to the other, just so they knew they had not fallen asleep and were not falling out of the tree to a horrible death. And so a few hours went by like this, where it was silence, with the exception of the sounds of this crocodile repositioning itself periodically. A little after midnight, a huge storm rolled into this area and it began absolutely downpouring and the raindrops that were hitting the river were so loud that the teens could no longer hear the sound of this crocodile. And so they had no idea if it was still down below them or not. But every time lightning would strike, it would illuminate the sky for that flash of a second. And in that flash, they would look down and there would be the crocodile. After several hours of this super intense downpour, the two teens also started to become concerned that all this additional rain could raise the water level of the river all the way up high enough that this crocodile might be able to jump out and reach their legs. But because it was so dark, they couldn't actually see the top of the water, and so they had no way of knowing if the water levels were actually rising or not. And so they both kind of sucked their legs up onto this branch and tried to make themselves as small as they could while still remaining anchored to each other and also to the branch. And that's how they sat for the next several hours, just hoping they would survive the night. Finally, when the sun came up that following morning, the teens immediately noticed that the crocodile was still right below them, just lurking at the base of the tree waiting for them. And they also noticed the water level of the river had clearly come up quite a bit. And so if they weren't rescued soon, there was a good chance that another heavy rainstorm, that crocodile would be in range of them and there was nowhere they could go. They were as high up as they could get. Not to mention the fact they were hypothermic, they were weak, they were tired, and if you fall asleep, you're gonna fall in the water. And so the two teens, they knew they did not have much time left. Luckily, at 10 a.m. that morning, they heard the sound of a police officer who was out in the mangrove forest. It turned out their families had recognized their absence. They had called the police, and that morning, a search had been launched. They had found their truck and then had been walking down the river yelling out to them, and then they finally did find them. Initially, when they located these two teens stuck in the tree, they called in a helicopter to hover over them and lower down a ladder that could climb back up. But when the helicopter got close to this tree, the rotor wash from the spinning blades, it practically blew the boys out of the tree. And this crocodile was still in the water. The rescuers could see it, the boys could still see it. And so there was this fear that the helicopter would literally send them into the water to their death. And so they had to abandon the helicopter approach. However, the blades of that helicopter did ultimately scare this crocodile and the crocodile swam away. And so as soon as the helicopter was off station, they had a boat come in and the boat got right underneath the two boys. They jumped down into it and they were brought to safety. The two boys were brought to a hospital where doctors determined they were physically okay, but both of them were severely traumatized from what they had just been through. As for Brett, despite an exhaustive search of that river, they never found his body or any of his clothing or any belongings he had on him, and they never found the crocodile that killed him.
killed him. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please offer to do the five-star review buttons laundry, but be sure to stop the dryer when their clothes are still slightly damp. Also, please subscribe to the Mr. Ballin podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories I have posted on my YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. Lastly, we have some really cool merchandise, so head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. So that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, see ya.